Hey all and welcome to the latest tutorial. My name is Luke and today I'll step you through everything you need to recreate an absolutely amazing scene like this. I dreamed of places like this as a kid. I guess this miniature version will have to do. I got inspired to build this model after seeing an Instagram post from On Track Model Railroad. I'll leave a link in the description so you can go and check out some of his awesome work. So let's not waste any more time and get started building. I start by building the trees. They are made mostly with foam and plaster, however these 4mm Tasmanian oak dowel rods are used for extra strength. The trees represent tall redwood trees commonly found in California and are roughly 60cm tall in HO scale, which would make them about 52 meters or 171 feet tall in real life. The body of the trunk is made with extruded polystyrene. Two strips are cut long enough to cover the dowel rod and at a thickness that will allow for the trunk diameter of about 2.5 cm. Lining the knife up with a piece of tubed aluminium like this helps me cut into the foam at a perfect 90 degree angle. Each of the strips that has been cut have a shallow channel cut into them roughly down the centre of each strip. It doesn't have to be perfect, however making a centre line will help. You want the channel to be about 2 mm deep on each strip. The dowel gets hot glued into the channel. More hot glue is added over the top and the two strips are firmly pressed together. Now here comes the mess. Obviously a square trunk is somewhat unrealistic, so with a sharp hobby knife I start to cut away parts of the foam slowly rounding out the trunk and having it taper off towards the top of the tree. It's pretty straightforward. Just make sure to cut away from yourself to prevent cutting your hand or worse. It doesn't matter if you cut right down to the dowel at the top. That's actually the plan as the dowel forms the very tip of the tree. As you can see it gets a bit messy. An extra piece of dowel is sharpened and added to the base of each trunk. This will make it easier to mount the trees into the scene but in hindsight I should have just made the dowel inside the trunk longer. To add volume and texture to the trunk, I'm using plaster. This is a modelling plaster called Sculptit Modelling Mix from Officeworks in Australia. However, it's very similar to the more common Sculptor mould found in most places around the world. Water is added until you are left with a thick paste. You want it to be able to hold its shape and not be runny. The plaster is pressed onto the trunk and spread out so that it forms a very thin layer right along the length of the trunk. If the plaster isn't sticking to the trunk, you can try using a wire brush to roughen up the surface of the foam. After about 15 minutes the plaster will start to set. It's around this time that I smooth out the surface. You can also use some extra plaster to model the base of the trunk, giving it a more natural shape. After another 15 minutes, I scribe in bark detail with the hobby knife. Gently dragging the knife across the surface will create the grooves. You can also use the back of the knife to add thicker grooves. I make sure to vary the direction slightly to add a bit of variety to the surface. Excess plaster is brushed away with a finger, which also subtly smooths any of the sharp edges left from the knife. This process is continued until the entire trunk has bark detail added. Before adding branches I plan out the position of each treehouse. That way I'll have a rough idea of how high up the trunk the treehouse will be and I can ensure I only add branches above that height. For the house I make sure I know the diameter of the trunk and using some paper I draw out the desired shape of the house. You can be a bit creative here. Having a unique shaped house makes for a more interesting scene if that's what you're going for. Using the drawn template as a guide, the footprint of the house is cut from 0.5mm styrene sheet. Gluing the template we drew onto the styrene makes cutting out the footprint much easier. A little trick with styrene is that you don't have to cut all the way through. Simply scoring one edge is enough, then simply snap the sheet at the scored edge. 
The walls are also made from 0.5mm styrene sheet and are cut to size. These don't need to be perfect as they will eventually be covered with strip wood. These walls act as the support for the wood we'll add later. Some fast setting styrene glue works well and some machinist's blocks will help keep everything true. As for windows and doors, some templates were printed on paper and lightly glued to the walls in the desired locations with spray adhesive. To cut out each window you have a few options. You can use a hobby knife to gradually cut through the styrene. You can also use something like a nibbler. Or in my case I used an ultrasonic cutting knife. These knives are great but they do have their limitations. This was only very thin styrene so it cut the windows out very easily. However it tends to melt the edges which isn't a problem as long as you don't mind sanding back the edges to get a nice smooth edge. I found it took about two passes with the knife to cut through the 0.5mm styrene. The houses are painted with Rust-Oleum khaki, which is a nice beige that will blend nicely with the strip wood exterior. The wooden planks for the walls are cut from 0.75mm birch plywood. Each plank is roughly 2mm wide and I cut enough to cover each house as well as extra for the decking that goes around the base of each of the houses. Each piece is prepared by passing it through some steel wool to remove any fuzzy bits of wood. It is then weathered by soaking it in India ink and water. I test one strip first just to make sure I get the desired effect and then all of the strips are dipped in the ink. They don't need long to soak up the ink. You can always add a second coating of ink if the strips aren't dark enough. Once dry, the strips can be glued onto the exterior. Having a tool like the chopper makes this job much easier. Each strip is pressed onto some clear packing tape, laying enough strips to get the desired height for the wall section you're building. For example, the sections under each window was only three strips high. However, the sections for the walls with no windows or door was 14 strips high. Each section gets measured and using the chop it, each piece is cut at the desired width. Now all I need to do is add some glue to the wall section and glue the strip wood to the styrene wall. It's surprising how quickly this all goes together and it looks amazing once the walls are done. It completely changes the look of the model. The roofs are traced and cut using styrene as well. By gluing some paper to the styrene first will make it much easier to draw the outline and cut out the template. I make sure to extend the edges by a couple of millimetres so the roof has some overhang. This curved piece sets the height and slope of our roof and matches the diameter of the tree. Thin strips are cut and used as bracing on the roof. They also help give the right amount of slope from the tallest part of the roof near the trunk out to the edges of the house. The gaps between the strips are filled with plaster of Paris, which will add strength and allow for a better shape. This will make adding the grass thatching much easier. It's mixed to a thick paste so it holds its shape and is manipulated on the roof until it has filled all the gaps. All of the windows and doors were designed using Tinkercad and 3D printed on the Nova 3D Elfin 3D printer. I highly recommend this printer, especially for making custom details for dioramas and model railroads. I also 3D printed the little figures and the furniture that's inside each of the houses. They are prepared and painted just like you would any other plastic model. Some light sanding may be required depending on how the model was orientated while printing. The parts are primed using some Tamiya light grey. And a quick tip, using a hair dryer can speed up the entire painting process. Just be careful that you don't put the hair dryer too close and actually melt the model. 
As for colour, various shades of browns and beige was used to get a nice wooden look. Some greys were dry brushed over the top to give a sense of age, and finally a dark brown oil wash was used to bring out the finer details and give a more dynamic look. I really enjoy using the oil paints for making washes. They flow really nicely into the gaps and give a very nice faded edge. The only downside is they take ages to dry, but if you're careful you can still work with the parts while the oil paint is still curing. I had some window glazing left over from the high rise building, so I used some of that on the back of each window. I find that spraying the back of the window frame with spray adhesive makes adding the glazing much easier and faster. The glass is simply pressed onto the back of the window with no worry about glue smudging across the glass or super glue fogging up the window. When we add the glue around the edges of the window frame, in order to glue the window into the building, this will act as a bit of extra reinforcement that will hold the window glazing in place. Now each window is fixed in its respective position. Now that the roofs have had time to dry, I can refine their shape and cut away any excess styrene that was hanging over the edge. These also get coated with khaki spray paint, both on the top and bottom. For the thatched roof look, I'm using the Woodland Scenics Static King, along with some knock beige and brown 2.5mm static grass. The grass colour doesn't matter all that much, as we'll be painting over it later anyway. The two colours get mixed together inside the Static King hopper, so that it's ready to go. And next, the negative output wire is clipped to a metal tray. Each roof has a solid coat of spray adhesive sprayed on top. I found that 3M Super 77 is the best glue for this. Using the static grass applicator, the grass is added to the roof. Give it a nice thick coat of grass. Shake away the excess grass, then using a finger gently press the fibres down in such a way they follow the slope of the roof. Another coat of glue is applied and the process is repeated a second time. It really doesn't take much for the roof to transform into a great looking thatched roof. As for painting, you can use any variety of colours you want. I used a variety of browns and greys to get an aged roof look. To build the deck, I use a template that has a light coat of spray adhesive applied. Using the birch plywood strips we cut earlier, I line them up over the template so they span the entire width of the desired deck area. Once the deck is covered, any excess is trimmed away. With the template remaining in place, I begin to glue on the framing detail on the bottom side of the deck. This is the structure that holds the entire deck together. It's a slow process, but it looks great once finished. Now that the frame is holding the deck together, I can remove the paper template. Before adding the branches to the trunk, I mark out the position of each of the tree houses. Next are the branches. I used actual twigs from a tree in the yard. Just make sure they are dead branches and try to find twigs with fine branch detail. Each of the branches are cut down to about 3 centimeters long, and for each tree I'll need roughly 50 individual branches. Some Woodland Scenics Hobby Tack is applied to the tip of each of the branches. This makes adding the finer seafoam twigs much easier. The Hobby Tack glue takes about 20 minutes to become tacky, so while that's drying, I start gathering all the seafoam twigs to be added. This stuff is perfect for fine branch tea towel. However, an alternative to use if you can't get your hands on any of the seafoam is Woodland Scenic's fine leaf foliage, which also works very well. Although the green foam leaves have already been attached, so you'd have to do this step after painting the tree. Each tiny piece of seafoam gets pressed onto the end of each twig. The Hobby Tech glue should be able to hold it straight away. But I add an extra drop of super glue as well, just to make sure the sea foam won't fall off. I found the hobby tack alone doesn't like humidity, and sometimes the branches can fall off over time. 
Super glue makes sure that that doesn't happen. Now just do that an extra 49 times, or in my case another 149 times for three trees. Branches are quite easy to attach to the trunk given it's only a very thin layer of plaster and a foam core. A small hole for each branch is created using the hobby knife and each branch is glued in with tacky glue. Like most of the steps building this diorama, it's a time consuming process. But seeing the tree transform into something that looks amazing is great motivation to keep going. The tiny branches up the top are glued directly onto the trunk without the need to bore a hole. The tackiness of the glue alone is enough to hold the small branches in position. The tree houses don't fit perfectly, so you may need to cut or sand away excess plaster in order to get the building to fit snugly. Because the deck goes around the trunk past the halfway mark, you'll need to cut a groove so the deck can slot past the trunk. Just be really careful you don't cut into the dowel in the center of the trunk or your tree will probably fall over. Gaps like this will be hidden later with some bits of strip wood. There's a four step process for painting the trunk. First involves coating the tree in diluted Mod Podge matte. It's the same glue I use for fixing down the scenery made up of one part glue and three parts water with a drop of dish soap. This layer prevents the plaster soaking up all the moisture from the paint and will make it much easier to get a nice effect using the ink washers later. Once the glue is dry, the rest of the tree is painted using burnt umber. I apply it so there is a slight color variation along the trunk by applying it slightly heavier and lighter in spots along the trunk. I make sure to cover the tiny branches as well with paint so everything ties together nicely. To bring out all the detail we did to make the bark texture, I used India ink. Make sure to test the strength of the solution on some paper first, and when you're happy with the color, the ink is brushed over the trunk. I mainly focus on the lower portion of the trunk with this step, although some of the larger gaps between the branches, I add some ink there as well. You may need to do more than one coat to get the desired effect. The last step is a light dry brushing of some silver grey over the lower part of the trunk. It's only a very light application that gives a nice subtle effect of aged wood. Woodland Scenic's medium green coarse turf is used for the leaves. The branches are sprayed with spray adhesive. Doing my best to only apply the glue to the branches while avoid getting glue on the tree trunk. The coarse turf can be gently pressed onto the branches. Remember to be gentle as the branches are quite fragile and easy to break. Depending on the density of foliage you want, you may need to do additional coats of glue and coarse turf. I ended up applying a second layer of glue and coarse turf to get the desired look I was after. It's quite the transformation once the tree is covered in foliage. And as a last little step, some fine turf weeds is sprinkled over the top of the last layer and any excess is shaken away. This just adds a very subtle color variation. To seal it all in place, the foliage is sprayed with some matte varnish. This will remove the tackiness left behind from the spray adhesive and it will also slightly darken the color of the foliage, giving it a more pine needle color, more typical for these types of trees. Before the tree houses are attached, I added some furniture inside. As mentioned, these were also 3D printed on the Nova 3D Elfin 3D printer. The roofs can be attached at this point using some tacky glue. Make sure not to use super glue, otherwise you'll cause the window glazing to become foggy. The house can also be glued onto the decking using the same glue. To fix the tree house to the trunk, I used a decent amount of the tacky glue along the surfaces that will be in contact with the trunk. I want to make sure it has a good hold and won't fall off. Depending on how tight the fit is, you may need to prop the tree on its side while the glue dries. Just be sure to take your time and ensure the house is leveled as good as you can get it. To hide those gaps, some bits of strip wood are used 
and made to look like bracing material around the tree. Additional bracing and support beams are added around the base of the treehouse as well, being somewhat random but making it look believable at the same time. Handrails were also attached around each of the decks as well. We wouldn't want anyone falling off to the hard ground below. It's one of those intricate fiddly jobs, but the rails look awesome when they have been finished. It makes the whole structure look much more believable. With the tree complete, for the most part I can move on to creating the base. Nothing too fancy, just some plywood cut to size so that it will fit perfectly on the chosen shelf. I would normally nail these together with a hammer and nail, but I recently picked up a large staple gun that makes jobs like this very quick. And it's a perfect fit. The position of each tree is marked with the base on the shelf so that the tree isn't too close to the wall. Small blocks are used to raise the trunk from the base. This will allow me to have the ground undulated above and below the very bottom of the tree trunks. Holes are drilled for their mounting pins and the trees are tested in place just to be sure it all fits together. Like with all of my dioramas, the ground is built up using plaster modelling mix. The same stuff we used on the tree trunks. It gets mixed to the same thick paste that will be able to hold its shape. As an experiment I added some paint to the plaster mix to give it a more natural dirt colour. This worked for the most part, however I probably would have been better at adding a darker brown like burnt umber. The plaster is pushed around and manipulated as required until the area is covered. As the plaster starts to harden, I continue to smooth it out leaving a nice smooth surface. The dirt texture is added using a variety of dirt. A fine to medium textured dirt, a coarse textured dirt, and a very fine textured dirt for roads and paths. To fix the layers I use isopropyl alcohol and some scenic glue. The surface is painted a dirt brown which also acts as a glue to hold the initial layer of dirt. Given that the plaster is already coloured, I could have simply sprayed the area with scenic glue and applied the dirt as well. The medium textured dirt is applied first and covers the entire diorama. If the dirt is struggling to stick to the sloping areas, a light misting of alcohol will help the dirt get an initial adhesion. Next is the coarse dirt. It's applied randomly across the diorama in areas infrequently travelled on. And finally the dirt that is much lighter in colour is applied over areas like paths and roads indicating those areas get used and walked across much more often. The whole area is permanently fixed by applying a misting of isopropyl alcohol followed by a misting of the scenic glue. If you find the glue is pulling up and creating puddles, you can soak up excess with a paper towel. Once all that is dry, the static grass can be applied. Again using the static king, along with some static tack. I used a variety of grasses, starting with the longer 6mm grass, followed up with some 4mm grass, and lastly some 2mm grass. The hopper is filled with the desired colours and mixed together if necessary so that it is ready to go. Glue is randomly dabbed around. I try to apply glue in patches with bare areas in and around the glue. Now the applicator is turned on and held about an inch from the surface. It's always fun seeing the model transform with static grass. To remove excess grass, the diorama can be flipped upside down and tapped. I make sure to collect any excess grass for use on other models. Next I apply glue around some of the edges of the longer 6mm grass and add the small 4 and 2mm grasses to help blend between the dirt and the longer grass. Some weeds, bushes and dead leaves are simulated with a selection of coarse foams and some actual dried leaves collected from the yard. 
the dried leaves are put in a blender to break them down, reducing them in size to something that closely resembles dead leaves in HO scale. All of these textures are spread across the diorama. More of the coarse dirt is added as well over the static grass, and I also add some small branches on the ground as well to simulate fallen, dead branches from the trees. The textures are added randomly across the scene in desired locations to build up the texture. There's no right or wrong way to do this. Just keep adding the textures until you get something that looks good. If texturing gets in undesired spots, you can simply use a brush to dust them away. The brush is also used to help bed in some of the textures and prevent them from floating above the static grass. All of this is fixed with isopropyl alcohol and scenic glue. Next are the trees. I make sure to test fit each tree before gluing. Hot glue is used to fix them down. I used quite a lot of hot glue and any hot glue that oozes out from under the trunk can be wiped away. The gaps and imperfections around the base of each tree will be covered shortly. Just make sure to hold the tree straight while the glue cools down and hardens, otherwise you might end up with a crooked tree. To cover the gaps, a small amount of glue is painted around the base and some dirt texture is used to build up the ground level. This can be sealed with alcohol and scenic glue using an eyedropper or a syringe. Small trees and shrubs are made with Woodland Scenic's fine leaf foliage. This stuff is great for small bushes. A small amount is broken from a larger stem and planted into the scene with some tacky glue. It can also be bunched together to make larger bushes or it can be separated to make small individual trees and saplings. We're almost finished. We just need to add our bridge to connect the two houses. This is another fiddly job and requires some patience. Bead thread works well to span the gap and once it's taped down, a very small amount of glue is applied and some planks are added to span the length of the bridge. A bit of extra glue was added to the back of the planks to give them a bit more reinforcement. Now it can be glued in place connecting the two tree houses together. For the handrails, I used some very fine jewellery chain as it tends to give a much more natural drooping look across the bridge. The upright posts were added after the chain was in place. The chain is lightly weathered with an oil wash just to dull down the colour a little. To highlight the paths underneath the trees, some yellow ochre pastel is brushed on and feathered out in areas where people would be walking. The last step is framing the scene by painting the edges black. And we're finished. This scene turned out amazing and it's a real eye-catching scene that tells a very interesting story. If you want to check out more photos, you'll find them on my website in the photo gallery. There will be a link in the description. I hope you enjoyed watching and if you want to make sure you don't miss future videos like this, be sure to subscribe. Cheers and thanks for watching.